I've had a lot of tough jobs. I've had things that were tougher. Although I'll let you know that better at the end of eight years, perhaps eight years. <laughs> 751, Big 550. KTRS. Well, the 100-day mark is in the rearview mirror. Donald Trump has now settled into the White House. Stephen Roberts, ABC News political analyst. We're off and running for the uh, for the rest of his uh, term. What what do we expect uh, going forward, sir? Well, it was very interesting over the weekend, McGraw, when Trump, in a variety of interviews marking the 100 days, said two things of note. One is he realizes how much more difficult the job of president is than he anticipated, and also how much slower the legislative process in Washington operates. Now, anybody who's been in government for a while understands those things, but of course Trump has not been in government. He's never served in the legislature, never had to negotiate the kind of complex legislative compromises that happen every day on Capitol Hill. So um, he's got a pretty steep learning curve here. And um, He's also learning that uh, translating campaign rhetoric into actual policies is very difficult. You take the issue of the wall, right? He campaigned repeatedly on that. It was a great uh, slogan during rallies, people uh, chanting, build a wall, build a wall. Gets to Washington and Democrats say, we're not going to build a wall. We're not going to vote for that. Even a lot of Republicans uh, think it's a terrible idea. It, won't work. It'll cost a great deal of money, and it would send a signal to the rest of the world that we're undermining and defying our own values of inclusion and welcome uh, to refugees and immigrants. So um, the new spending bill, which is apparently going to be uh, uh, voted on this week, is not going to contain money for one of his pet projects. It's a perfect example of, of how uh, translating campaign rhetoric into complex policy far more difficult than Donald Trump ever imagined. Well, so if you're a Trump voter and a Trump supporter, you wanted the wall money, you wanted uh, all of these things. You wanted to repeal and replace, and you wanted to defund Planned Parenthood, and all of these things that are not in this new first budget out of the box. So how is he squaring what he said on the campaign and what he's actually doing or not doing in Washington, D.C.? <sighs> Well, you know, so much of Trump's support, as you and I talked about many times, is personal. It's 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 a identification with an attitude, a mood, uh, drain the swamp, uh, tear down Washington, um, uh, blow the place up. These are not policies. These are slogans. These are attitudes. And the truth is that uh, Trump's uh, voters, the core supporters, continue to believe in him. Uh, our polls are very clear about that at ABC. His favorable rating is only 42 percent, which is dismal. But his supporters remain uh, fiercely loyal. Only 2 percent said they regret voting for him. Um, and I think they're going to give him a lot of uh, credit and a lot of room uh, because, as I say, their, their strong identification with Trump it's not really about individual policies. It's about a posture. It's about an attitude. But in the long run, Trump, you played that clip about four or eight years. Down the line, if he doesn't make good on his promises, particularly I, things like the wall, I think, are less important. What really is at the core of his promises, and that's he is really going to decide whether he's a successful president or not in many ways, is the question of jobs, and particularly jobs in the older industrial areas that have lost manufacturing jobs. You know, people in St. Louis know what I'm talking about. And um, uh, if he can't uh, deliver on those promises, then I think the base is going to start to sour. But that's far in the future. They're, they're behind him for now. We, what's interesting about all of this, and I don't know how well this is flushed out, but the civil war going on between the Republican Party, Donald Trump was somehow able to navigate that during um, the um, election cycle, but now he has to govern it. There are three parties. There's two Republican parties and the Democratic Party. So to get them to agree on, on, on anything is almost impossible. Well, you, you make a good point. Look, when, when Republicans for eight years, uh, they were united by a set of very simple uh, ideas. Uh, we don't like Barack Obama, and we're going to oppose everything he does. And we don't like Hillary Clinton, and we're going to oppose everything she does. Uh, and those were powerful, unifying ideas. And they papered over and masked those fault lines, those fractures in the Republican Party. Uh, but when you're in opposition, it's a lot easier to just simply say no. When you're in the majority and you actually have to craft legislation, 
all of those rivalries, all of those fractures come to the surface. Uh, and that's exactly what is happening to the Republican Party today. As you point out, it's not just that Democrats have 48 seats in the Senate and, and, and can filibuster, but the Republican Party itself is fractured. We saw this in the health care debate where both hardline conservatives and some of the moderates both opposed the bill that came down and it, and it never even came up to a vote. So, um, uh, you know, Republicans uh, have for eight years been the party of no. Uh, it's been comfortable. It's been easy. It's been unifying um, and uh, adjusting to trying to uh, put together legislation that can attract a majority vote and attract, in, in many cases, some Democratic support is proving to be very, very difficult. And over the weekend, Trump said, you know, I'm really surprised at how hard the job is. Well, duh. If you had served in, in, in Washington before, you would have known that already. <laughs> Any comments on the White House Correspondents' Dinner? Well, you know, it was interesting. I, I didn't go, but I've, I've, I've watched a lot of the video. Um, you know, the, the split screen of Trump out there in Harrisburg uh, attacking the press, um, I think there's a mood among the press corps in Washington today uh, of, of, uh, that our role is even more important than ever. Faced with a president um, who not only derides and demeans the press at every opportunity, uh, but has uh, given to fabrications and misleading statements, our job to hold him in account is more important than ever. But if we do that, we've got to be darn careful that we're fair to him. I think in the rush to hold him accountable, journalists have made some mistakes. They've rushed to judgment. Um, and if we're going to maintain our credibility as a, as a counterweight and uh, a constitutional counterweight to the president, we've also got to be fair to him at the same time. Stephen Roberts, great as always. Thanks for checking in. ABC News political analyst Stephen Roberts, 750.